So when we ask for climate action, what are we actually demanding for? So I just want to bring to you a quote from uh, a friend of mine. Um, the debate about climate change is fundamentally about political economy at the end of the day. So if you start from a perspective that negotiations on climate change, whether it's negotiation at the UNFCCC level or negotiations between the citizens and the government, it's, it's, really a, it's not really about climate change or the environment. Because then you don't really understand what the negotiation is about if you think that those are the two main things. Ambitious action on climate change is, sorry to say, it's quite elusive because powerful economic best, vested interests don't want to lose their economic power and control. So they ensure governments act in their interests and not it in ours. for the very illustrious introduction. I hope I live up to the hype. <laughs> but thank you so much, all 60 of you, and there are some more in, on Facebook Live who have uh, dialed in and joined us this evening. Uh, thanks for coming on time, and those who are joining, welcome to Jedi's fourth uh, Zoom meeting. So um, before, with, without further ado, let's just dive into um, the presentation tonight. We have a lot of grounds to cover, but I hope that at the end of the night, um, there will be one takeaway message um, for all of you here today. Um, right, let me begin. So as you all know, uh, the title for tonight's presentation is What Does Climate Action Look Like? And I believe um, every one of you do have an inkling of idea or some kind of perception how that would look like to you. Um, but today is not just about talking about a list of actions, like a prescriptive action that we can take, but it's more of um, looking at the philosophy, looking at the history and looking at the school of thoughts that govern behind what climate change uh, is and how it is being defined. So to start with, I would like to walk you through quickly on climate change. I'm sure all of you know what climate change is, but um, just as an introduction, it is a crisis of our time. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have seen this report. It's one of the latest special reports from the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. What it essentially means is that it's a, it's a group of scientists all over the world that sits down and look at existing scientific literature and come out with this report to advise governments and national uh, nations on what to do. So this global warming report, um, global warming of 1.5 Celsius. So it was, um, it, the idea was thought during the uh, COP21 in Paris, in 2015. So the, the United Nations Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, had invited the IPCC to produce this special report. So it studies the impact of global warming of 1.5 Celsius above pre-industrial levels and related global greenhouse gas emission pathways. So the key finding is this. We only have 12 years for global warming to be kept at a maximum of 1.5 degrees. And beyond that, even if it's just half degree beyond that, it will significantly worsen the risks of drought, floods, extreme heat, and poverty for hundreds and millions of people. So this report was completed three years later, which is in 2018. So we have 12 years from 2018. So we already spent two years, kind of, 1.5. So what is our climate reality today? So we are looking at possibly 62 million people affected by extreme weather in 2018 and we are talking about more as time goes along. And 25,000 number of living species in danger of extinction at the rate accelerated by climate change. So let's get down to understanding the institutional structure that uh, revolves around our climate action. So I want you to look at this pyramid here. At the very top, you'll see the international level where the IPCC and the UNFCC is. 
So IPCC is where all the scientific deliberation is done. And the UNFCCC is where governments come together and negotiate an agreement on how to keep the global warming to be below or at 1.5 Celsius. So this agreement would be carried out, will be taken home by each national government and implemented. So in Malaysia, our focal point is the Ministry of Environment and Water. In the past, it was NESTEC. And the executive, meaning the agencies, government agencies that will uh, turn this into plans, guidelines and actions on the ground. So in terms of implementation, is at the local level where you see at the bottom of the pyramid, which is the largest. It, it's true because of this, um, the, the number of places that's there, which is the state governments and agencies, the civil societies, private sectors, including news media, academia, members of public. So everyone has a role to play here. So what is Malaysia's commitment under the UNFCCC? Some of you may wonder. So it's always been this, Malaysia intends to reduce greenhouse gas emission intensity of GDP by 45% by 2030 relative to the emissions and intensity of GDP in 2005 as a baseline. So uh, to break it down 45%, 35% is on unconditional basis, meaning this is what Malaysia will do. And a further 10% is conditional, meaning Malaysia to receive climate finance, technology transfer and capacity building from developed countries. And this is um, enshrined under the Paris Agreement and the uh, UNFCCC. So at the 21st COP, which is in Paris, Malaysia has also reiterated its commitment to maintain at least 50% of the country under forest cover. So someone asked me on Twitter uh, just this evening, what is Malaysia's commitment um, in terms of forest cover? The latest stats, I'm not too sure, um, Frim may have it, but in 2015, the forest cover was 54.5%. But it's very close to the at least minimum number uh, percentage of forest cover. So we need to be on the lookout here. So this is Malaysia's reports so far that has been submitted to the UNFCCC. So in 2000, we have the initial national communication. Uh, in 2011, the second one, and then the biennial report in 2015, 2018. And Malaysia also have uh, a national policy on climate change, which was produced 10 years ago. Um, I think some of you may have seen this before. And what I was uh, made to understand that they are in the process of looking at updating this. So uh, some of you may be wondering what is national communication. It's actually reports on activities and implementation of the country's commitments. And the biennial report, which is um, submitted every midterm of the five years reporting time, is the update of the national uh, greenhouse gas inventories. And that includes the national inventory report, information on the mitigation actions, needs, and the support that has been received. So the environmental ministry, and I put it as environmental ministry because it was messed up before, now it's MEWA, and even MEWA, we're not very sure uh, if it's still going to be MEWA in terms of its name. Um, but climate change has categorically been removed from the ministry, which is quite a concern to quite a lot of us. Uh, the Malaysian Youth Delegate has written an open letter to request for the ministry to consider putting back, you know, the, the, the the word climate change back into the ministry because it reflects commitment. So back to this, the environmental ministry has always been the national focal point for Malaysia's international climate change agreement. So Malaysia's uh, MESTEC or MEWA will be representing Malaysia at the UNFCCC with a bunch of negotiators. But at the country level at Malaysia, the economic planning, uh, the economic ministry uh, in the past it was MEA, Ministry of Economic Affairs, and now I think it's EPU, Economic Planning Unit, uh, will incorporate these commitments that you see earlier into the Malaysian plans as far as possible. So it sets the framework for climate responsive policies and collate every climate related plans and programs across different governmental departments and agencies. So this is the latest one, 11th Malaysia plan. and. Um, well, MEA doesn't exist anymore. I think it's EPU now. Uh, it's, it's 
going to do the 12th Malaysian plan right now. It should be ready by end of this year. So again, draw your attention back to the pyramid. Um, so materializing the government's international commitment depends a lot on how mainstream climate planning is across various ministries, including the state's department and agencies. But to actually implement these climate commitments on the ground ultimately depends on how the local governments execute these plans, which is then highly dependent on available budget, expertise and manpower. So the second part of this um, presentation is on climate actions and the key actors. Let's just um, identify where they are. So uh, just to take your attention back to the 11th Malaysia plan, because this encapsulates what the climate action should look like in general. So the economic ministry aimed to decouple natural resource use and environmental impacts from economic growth through the RMK. And, and this is precisely taken out from the 11th Malaysia plan and to build resilience against climate change and disaster risk and mitigate environmental degradation and facilitate the necessary governance to support implementation, which is policy reforms, institutional framework reforms, enhancing enforcement and capabilities, monitoring, evaluation. And all these are captured in the 11th Malaysian plan. So at the policy level, who, who makes it into um, like a directive. So in the past, uh, in 2017, we have KETA, which is the Ministry of Environment, Green Tech and Water, which of course doesn't exist anymore, but it, it did produce something called the Green Technology Master Plan Malaysia. So this plan was actually um, an outcome from the Malaysian, 11 Malaysian plan. So they are kind of like parallel documents. So it's a sectoral approach to decouple economic growth from natural capital depletion. And it looks like it looks at energy, manufacturing, transport, building, waste and water. It's quite comprehensive. I think it's about 200 over pages. Um, if any of you are interested, we'll put the link in um, the Jedi Facebook page. And these are just a summary of all the commitments. So as you can see in this report, it's a, it's a plan for 2017 until 2030. So uh, the sectors, sectoral approach, which is the energy. So as you can see here, by 2020, um, Malaysia aims to have 20% of renewable energy mix. And then in 2025, increase another 3%. And then in 2030, 30%. So as it goes, public transport as well, 40% of model share, meaning um, public transport, 40%, 60% uh, private vehicles and other cities is 20% and then up to 2025, green building design, sustainable construction practices, green building materials, and that one is in the building sector. And then we have the targets in waste sector as well. We want a 22% of recycling rate by 2020, which I think we have not really achieved yet. Uh, and then 2025, 2030. And then of course, you have the water sector as well. Um, we look at the integrated river, manage, um, river basin management, water treatment and distribution and all these targets. So bringing forward to something more recent, which is in 2019, uh, we have the birth of, I mean, we have MESTEC. So MESTEC has um, an initiative document in 2019. And I just want to pull out the environment and climate change sector. Um, I highlight the ones that I feel is quite important, which is number one, to develop mitigation and adaptation plans for climate change. Um, that being said, we actually don't have yet one. And we also are drafting the Climate Change Act 2021 bill. And in an energy sector, 20% uh, renewable energy mix by 2025. Um, the reason why I pull out some in the energy sector is actually more than that. It's because I just want to compare the commitment between during when it's Keta's time and Mestec's time. Um, and as you can see, during Keta's time, it's 2020, uh, 20%, but only 20% in 2025 for MESDAC. So, you know, things do change a bit. So, I just want to bring to you, to your attention as well, um, this agency called the Malaysian Green Technology and 
Climate Change Center, MGTC. So it's a government agency under the purview of the Ministry of Environment back in 2010. And it's mandated to lead the nation in areas of green growth through green incentive and certification, green advisory and capacity building, green promotion and investment. But in 2019, it was rebranded to Malaysian Green Technology and Climate Change Center, which is MGTCCC. But you can just call it MGTC, they have kind of changed the acronym. So the new additional responsibility that they have include policy analysis. So national reporting, the, the, the few documents that I showed you earlier, now is their responsibility and national program coordination, focal point for climate change data and communication. And they also do education and public awareness, which is in short form called CEPA, CEPA. So this is another important actor to look out for. And this is uh, quite new. Um, Bank Nagara actually came out last year with something, a discussion paper called the Climate Change and Principle Based taxonomy. So our central banks is also looking into climate risks now. So Bank Nagara Malaysia considers climate change as a material source of risk that could pose threats to financial stability. So the discussion paper presents an overview of climate change and its impact on financial system. So it facilitates financial institutions to identify and classify economic activities that could contribute to climate change objectives. And it will supervise and these supervised institutions are therefore expected to integrate climate related risk and consideration into their business strategies and risk management practices. So what are the risks that they have identified? Largely there are three physical risks which arise from climate related events that damage properties, reduce productivity and disrupt trade. Transition risks arises from transitioning to a lower carbon economy which may entail extensive policy, legal, technology and market changes to address mitigation and adaptation requirements and liability risk. It entails legal risk and claims on damages and losses incurred from the effects of physical and transition risk. So um, what I'm trying to put out here is that Bank Nagara is already recognizing climate change as a real possible risk and they are at a stage where they are collecting um, feedback from financial sector to um, fine-tune this document. So how does um, climate action and its actors look like at the city level? And I took this from the UN Habitat. So at the local government, you have um, maybe regulations to enforce zero carbon buildings by 2030. So, or the mayor can have a commitment to only purchase zero carbon buses from 2020. And even planners, they make sure that their plans are climate proof or they study climate in planning. How about businesses? They can invest in local projects that boost climate resilience and um, investing in investigating a complete transformation of how we do business and become a net climate leader. And so this corresponds back to what uh, the discussion paper from Bank Nagara. So media also plays a role at the city level. They can cover climate news because they can become the mouthpiece, they can become an information disseminator, they can mainstream climate news, uh, not just as a sort of by, uh, by the way environmental news, but a news that everyone should start paying attention to and you know in um, broadcast as well they can have a program portray to portray climate action champions in the city in com within communities as well you can start a local group in uh, your community to lobby your local government to plant let's say more trees or have more urban farms um, and then uh, you can engage your community together when looking at issues like water shortage and things like that so these are some of the actions that cities can already start taking. The second part of my um, presentation is on the challenges in turning policies, plans into action. As you see before, we have all the plans and policies. They're really good. They have catch up all the essence of how climate action would look like at different levels, but there are still challenges and let's get into them. So although fighting climate change could boost the global economy as much as 26 trillion in economic benefits by 2030. Most governments are 
frankly not yet convinced to spend billions now to save trillions in the future, especially when it demands fundamental structural changes. And it is even harder to convince governments to spend considerable amount of money on climate adaptation measures for problems they deem not yet apparent and provide no foreseeable economic returns when there are so many issues that demand the government's immediate attention. So let's look at the challenges faced by different actors. So let's start with information providers. So academia, research institutes like Academy Science Malaysia, Nahrim, Sidpuri and government departments do provide important uh, climate related information, resources and advice to government to shape national policies. But one, they are often hampered by the lack of robust data collection, which means you don't get the same discreteness of data in different states. Like if you want to collect um, data on forest cover, maybe a certain state start collecting the data from year 1999 and another state started in 2016. So you don't really have a good uh, data robustness and some of the way they collect the data is, is in different methodology, they are not streamlined. And you must also understand that not all state government are, have the same capacity to deploy people to be on the ground to do all these things. So and they also have limited avenue and opportunity to lobby this into action at the local level. So oftentimes they find that their role and their task stops there at advice. And whether or not the state government or the federal government take action, it's, it's entirely sometimes out of their hands. And how about the ground movers? So majority of lobbying and advocacy for mobilizing climate actions on the ground, which also includes preventing harmful activities that exacerbates climate change impacts, usually come from civil societies and activists. But number one, their movement and their impact are often restricted by funding and manpower issues. Number two, they have limited or very superficial opportunity to engage in decision-making processes at the local level. Number three, the public's indifferent perception of the role of NGOs in climate action actually uh, hampers their su support for them to move forward because you need public buy-in to the things that you do. And thirdly, but not the least, political leadership, as we all know. Malaysia can definitely achieve more in terms of climate action, but it often lacks strong and sustained political will that is necessary to scale up nationwide climate action. So one, good policies and plans may be in place, but not well streamlined across different agencies. The budget may not always be available and priorities is usually on reacting to immediate problems, not on taking proactive actions. And the public in general does not prioritize climate actions as key measurement of the government's performance. For different reasons, because like I said before, climate change is still an abstract concept at best. If not, some have different interpretations of how climate change is, or is it climate crisis, or you know. Um, so, it's it's not it's not something so mainstream in people's consciousness yet. And and of course, people prioritize having jobs, um, economic growth, having a house, affordable homes. So, climate change is really probably at the bottom of their list most of the time. So. Challenging the powerful economic vested interest is to take a hard, honest look at system change in and ourselves. What do I mean when I put this out? So, climate action again. While, in the, while every individual must play their part, however big or small it is, we must also understand that there is no amount of plastic bags that can be avoided in our entire lifetime or a stringent practice of zero waste and low carbon mobility lifestyle would ever be sufficient to offset the scale of damage that ex exploiters and polluters, such as fossil fuel industry, rampant agriculture industrialization, unsustainable urbanization, among others, are still allowed to continue doing what it does to the climate and environment. So when we ask for climate action, what are we actually demanding for? 
So I just want to bring to you a quote from a friend of mine. Um, the debate about climate change is fundamentally about political economy at the end of the day. So if you start from a perspective that negotiations on climate change, whether it's negotiation at the UNFCCC level or negotiation between the citizens and the government, it's, it's, really a, it's not really about climate change or the environment. Because then you don't really understand what the negotiation is about if you think that those are the two main things. Ambitious action on climate change is, sorry to say, it's quite elusive because powerful economic best, vested interests don't want to lose their economic power and control. So they ensure governments act in their interests and not it in ours. So energy consumption is by far the biggest source of human caused greenhouse gas emissions responsible for a whooping 73% worldwide. So are we, when we ask for climate action, are we looking at the energy system to begin with? Are we ready to demand for the stop of big polluters social license, cut off their finance, expose their greenwashing, shut down their sites of production and their distribution system, making the case that energy is a public good, which it should be in public ownership and control and advocating for and building alternative energy system and models for equitable consumption. Secondly, our agriculture system is not primarily a food system, it's an industrial system and it's not sustainable. So are we ready to demand that our governments grow food to feed people and not focus solely on cash crops for the sake of export profits and to value and encourage local people who cultivate, grow, harvest and process food and prevent deforestation and land grabbing and halt agricultural practices that exacerbate desertification and destruction of biodiversity and natural habitat. Are we ready to look, take a serious look into our agriculture system, which somehow, if you take an honest look at ourselves, we are also benefiting from it, but it's also very environmentally destructive the way it is currently done. Can we reimagine ways to which we can gain back food sovereignty? And another aspect that I would like to cover is the construction industry. So if the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world behind China and the US. It contributes more CO2 than aviation fuel, 2.5%, and is not far behind the global agricultural business, which is 12%. So are we willing to call out on unsustainable climate, unresponsive and uninclusive urbanization, which is based on real estate speculation, land reclamation, and construction of infrastructure that encourage more carbon intensive development to continue well into our future. Are we looking at all these aspects or are we, um, is, is it something that we have come to normalize? So just an illustration of how we look at problems, uh, where do we turn to, how do we frame it? So when you look at the weather and you say it's crazy, do we look at necessarily the root cause of it? So this brings me to probably the final point, which is framing the problem. So like Salma was um, ahead of us when she asked about the question on pandemics. So these are the questions that I want to throw to you tonight. One of the questions um, is COVID-19 solely a problem about China's wildlife meat consumption? Will the world suddenly become a better place if we just address this issue? No doubt that the wildlife meat trade has to stop, but is the problem that simple? So how we frame the problem critically determines how we move forward. The way the world is currently responding to the COVID-19 pandemic is really a reflection of a deeper problem if you take a good hard look at it. To start with, COVID-19 has shined a spotlight on social inequality and food insecurity. So we know from our own big experience um, in Penang or in KL or wherever you're tuning in, as someone who lives in an urban area, you see social inequality in terms of how the homelessness have to cope with uh, the stay home movement. They don't have a home. Or the, uh, people who have been laid off from their work, uh, businesses have had to shut down and people who have no access to food. So these are the immediate emerging problems that we are 
it's starting to really see in front of us. So this leads us to face the fact that our current pattern of production and consumption is really unsustainable and is not resistant against external shocks. And this includes the flawed economic system that drives it. And these are often problems that we have been ignoring all this while because the society has been conditioned to normalize this environmental destruction, over-exploitation of natural resources, and the excessive wealth concentration as a form of development, economic growth, and progress. So, um, to take the IUCN statement that they recently released, then use change is a key driver of emerging zoonotic diseases, meaning um, diseases that come from animals to human beings. Deforestation, habitat fragmentation, and an expanding agricultural frontier increase the contact between human and other animals, potentially increasing the chances of zoonosis emerging and spreading. So the same problem, the very same problem that drives zoonotic diseases are one of the same that are also contributing to climate change. How so? COVID-19 and climate breakdown are interconnected crises. They are unintended consequences of a 500-year history of territorial expansion, conquest, resource extraction, and industrial growth as a byword for progress that has seen carbon pumped into the Earth's atmosphere at a rate that carbon sinks compromised by industrial deforestation cannot contain. Accordingly, COVID-19 can in no way be read as a black swan event, meaning a one-off event, an unusual event that will be behind us in no time and we can move on. Unfortunately, it's not like that. We'd do better to understand it instead as a kind of initiation into a new era of crisis, intrinsically connected to the extremist models of growth that dominate our global economy and the ecological imbalances that they bring. So in the face of in the face of this, only a transformative planetary vision, one that addresses the root cause of the imbalance, can serve to move us decisively through this moment of crisis and emergency. Though what will become increasingly clear to us all as this particular crisis unfolds is that there is no path to ecological restoration that doesn't begin by putting political and economic goals of social justice front and center. What this really means is put people first. So climate change and COVID, people have already made that relationship. It's not something made up. As you can see in certain news, there are big headlines like climate change won't stop for the coronavirus pandemic. Like what Salma just brought up uh, earlier, that while we are focusing on COVID, there's a bigger issue coming um, really soon, if not already here. Climate change is exacerbating risk stress by coronavirus. Climate disasters have already displaced 7 million people this year, nearly as twice as many as conflicts. And climate change will affect water availability, alter food production. And this is uh, quite a recent, I think it was just released today, this article about paddy farmers worrying more about droughts than virus. And this is um, Malaysia. So the source for Muda Agricultural Development Authority, the outfit that oversees and manages almost all paddy fields in Kedah, have confirmed that there has been indeed a serious water shortage. And some of the farmers, which I was, I mean, some of the WhatsApp group, confirmed with me that it has been at least a month that they are facing no water in the dam. So the Muda River and Ampang Jaja Dam both has inadequate water to supply all of our granary areas for now. And despite its centuries-long agrarian roots, Malaysia is one of the two rice-producing countries in the region, the other one being Philippines, that has been unable to farm enough rice to feed its ever-increasing population. And I think if you want to learn more about this, please uh, watch Dr. Kam's last week's presentation about food security. You have more interesting data from there. So, if you think people fighting over toilet paper looks bad, wait till they are fighting over food. This is a, a, something that George Monbiot just said. 
So Bangdagara discussion paper, which we have gone through earlier, quoted a study that gives us a glimpse of Malaysia's climate vulnerability. So the impact of physical risks resulting from climate events and natural disasters have been significant. In Malaysia alone, more than 50 natural disasters in the past 20 years have resulted in over 8 billion ringgit losses and more than 3 million people affected through displacement, injuries and death. And this does not include the, the um, problems that will arise when food crisis um, becomes even more apparent and water crisis. So really, this is our new normal. Um, I don't want to be alarmist, but I think it is important for us to be to be really sober about our current situation. It would be a huge waste of opportunity if we only focus on going back to the normal that we used to know before COVID-19. Instead of taking this time to reflect deeper on our rapidly changing future, whether you think about it or not, the change is already happening. There is just no post-climate change to revert to. People may be talking about going back to normal when COVID MCO restriction is lifted. But for climate change, there's no, you know, control Z, you know, undo button. The climate risk will be long-term and in irreversible. And public apathy, the lack of concern towards structural inequalities and system change will bring dire consequences. So really, this is, to quote Julio Vincent Gambuto, who wrote a really good article on Medium. If you are interested, the link is somewhere there and we'll also post it on Jedi. This is our chance to define a new version of normal, a rare and truly sacred opportunity to get rid of the bullshit and to only bring back what works for us, what makes our lives richer and what makes our kids happier, what makes us truly proud. So my question, last question back to you is this, what does your climate change action look like? Thank you.